on their app. I'm Tori Bedford. Tonight on Greater Boston, towns that fall under the controversial MBTA communities law are raising concerns about their ability to meet the law's requirements. One of those towns administrators joins me to share their concerns. Plus, from live music to Little League baseball, Cambridge's Danahee Park has plenty going on. One filmmaker decided to interview the people who make it so lively. He joins me to discuss the stories he heard. And then, is it Celtic or Celtic? Curiosity Desk's Edgar B. Herwick III answers one of Boston's oldest debates. Attorney General Andrea Campbell is hoping to take her case against Milton for voting to defy state housing law straight to Massachusetts' highest court. As a Supreme Judicial Court justice reviewing her challenge put it, Campbell is looking to, quote, send a shot across the bow to the under 100-plus cities and towns impacted by the law, which requires so-called MBTA communities to update zoning laws to allow for more multifamily housing. But even in cities and towns already complying with the MBTA Communities Act, as GBH News' Sarah Betancourt reports, there are other threats to the law's ability to produce more housing. Sarah joins me now, along with Jim Boudreau, town administrator in Situate, one of several communities raising concerns. Thank you both so much for being here. So, Sarah, how did you find this story and begin reporting on it? Because, you know, I was thinking, oh, it's the sewage story, right? Initially looking into infrastructure in these towns and sort of the smaller details that might impede them from building up all this housing, which is so desperately needed across the state. How did you first come across this and begin reporting on it? Yeah, so about a year ago, I filed a public records request with the state, um, just acting, asking for the town's action plans uh, to the state to see how they'd comply with the MBTA zoning law. And I noticed a trend in one of the comments section that over 20 towns were mentioning, hey, we have some concerns about sewer infrastructure. And the issue with the story was never about compliance. And we say it very clearly in the story what the MBTA Communities Act is, but you do have to think about what happens afterward. Because if you suddenly have the ability to create all of this multifamily housing, you need the infrastructure to make it happen. Right. And Jim, you're not opposed to building more housing. What are you coming up against in Situate? No. So Situate already is zoned for 12 units per acre by right around the MBTA stations. Before this even came Before this came even about. came in. Right. So the new zoning for us is 15. So it's really not a big change. We look at the adoption of the MBTA communities as a technical change to our current zoning. However, once you do the zoning, you can't do the building. So an example is a sky sale, which is an apartment complex, about 70 apartments in retail on the MBTA parking lot at Greenbush. Uh, they came in, they wanted to build it. There is sore there. We didn't have the capacity to allow them to build it. It wouldn't have fit in our sore system. So we ended up replacing a sore out by Cedar Point with the lighthouses. That's very old, very leaky. Uh, we got a $2.2 million mass works grant but it was a $7 million plus project. So mm -hmm. the, the town and the ratepayers had to come up with $5 million. That created enough capacity to build SkySail, which is now built and leasing. It's a great project. North Situate, where our other train station is, has no infrastructure, no pipes, no sewer, and we have to create capacity back at our plant in order to put the sewer in and take it. So uh, right now we're doing a $4 million INI project to create that capacity. We're going to vote. INI. Inflow and infiltration. So that's okay. seawater, groundwater, salt water that gets into the pipes and goes to your plant and counts towards what you're treating in your, your treatment number. So if you can get that out, that creates room to actually put more storage into the pipes. Okay. Um, so we're doing that, and then we're going to vote $2.2 million to design that saw uh, at the town meeting in April. So we, it's one of our goals to get that sword and get it built but it's gonna be very expensive and we're gonna need help to do it. Right, and the state is providing some funds for this. The state has, MassWorks is a great program. Uh, we got a $2.2 million grant for the sky sale, but it's a very competitive program. Mm -hmm. So we applied for a grant to help us with the design of the saw. We didn't get it um, because there's so many other needs for it. And even when you get it, that project's gonna be 12 to $20 million. The state's going to come up with some, hopefully, but then the town and the rate payers are going to have to come up with the rest of it. And when you look at a town like Situate, we've spent $30 million on water pipes. Uh, we just approved a $50 million water treatment plan as an override on the taxes, plus seawalls, then storage, regular police, regular fire. Um, it just it gets to be more than a town can handle. What is the timeline that you're looking at? Because obviously you could immediately build all this new housing with like 
our houses in the back, right? Yeah. But, but if you want to adequately set up a sewer system and the infrastructure, what are you thinking in terms of your timeline so for Situate? For North Situate, we're thinking three to five years. Uh, once we get it designed and we have the money to start building it, then the owners of that property will start coming in with their plans and they'll try to time their building with the saw so when the saw is done, the buildings are done. Uh, but that's going to be a three to five year project to get the saw designed, constructed, and up and running. Sarah, what is the scale of this? How many towns, you know, you spoke to, I think, half of the towns who, or more than 20 of the towns, you know, leaders and municipality leaders who have talked about these issues of just the infrastructure not being able to handle this kind of volume. What is the scale? Yeah, so in the documents I found itself, there were just 20 towns that had made some complaints and raised some concerns, but I've noticed in town meetings about the MBTA Communities Act that other towns that, you know, didn't mention that in the comments section are also raising concerns about sewers. And, I mean, Situate is a town that has, I think, about 30% of Situate is sewered, but there are towns that have no sewer at all, and there's also towns that connect to a regional sewer, uh, the water authority. And that means that they have a contract that specifically says you can allow 100,000, I'm just throwing an example out there, gallons of sewer to come here a day. And, you know, if you create more housing, you're going to want to, especially like multifamily units that are quite dense, like 40 to 60 units in a building, you're going to need to have increase contracts and changes to those contracts. So all of this needs to be taken into consideration. All of it costs time and money. Um, so it's it's really interesting that the state hasn't thought that far ahead for this. Um, and the state did tell me, you know, they have the MassWorks grants, which are fantastic. Um, they have a couple of other programs, um, but I noticed that one of those programs only had one of the towns that complained, like giving them money for sewer, it was Upton. Um, but then they mentioned we have the Affordable Homes Act, which is this massive piece of housing legislation that covers everything, including like other types of existing affordable housing and fixing them. Like there is a lot under that legislation and it just currently passed out of committee into another, but it has some money stipulated for infrastructure. Whether or not that will be for sewers, who knows, but it's pending. And some municipalities sort of need the, the money to start showing up sooner rather than later. And that's right. a concern. And there have been so many calls to address this housing crisis that we are immediately dealing with, not just in building new housing, but in addressing the existing infrastructure that's falling apart. And that, you know, that those calls are immediate. Last night we discussed that um, with members of the Greater Boston Interfaith Organization who have asked the state, you know, for this push to immediately address housing. And we were joined by Senator Lydia Edwards, who is the Senate Committee um, Housing Chair. And I asked her about your reporting. This is what she had to say. The MBTA laws uh, that people are oftentimes concerned about are planning laws. They're requiring that the city and town plan for additional units. There's no requirement that they start building them immediately. There's also not a lot of funding necessarily. So it's really a matter of an, an exercise for cities and towns to imagine and vision together uh, some more density in certain areas of their, of their communities. So we were kind of having this discussion about how this is a more long-term plan and as the state hears this kind of feedback, you know, that cities and towns like your, that you have raised, they will adapt to that and sort of accommodate that within this plan, but you have this timeline of three to five years and you've already requested grant money that's been rejected. I mean, what are you asking for from the state right now? It's not possible for a community to put in all this infrastructure without substantial assistance from the state because we have all the other things that we have to do. We have to have a balanced budget. Uh, we're constrained on what we can bring in for revenue by two and a half. So we need help from the state to do this. We don't want to pass the MB communities law and meet the compliance with zoning and say, okay, we're done, and, and not do anything to actually build the housing. One of the goals of my board is and has been to soar North Situate and get North Situate Business District back up, get it running, get it built out, turn it into a vibrant business district. That's one of their goals. It remains their goal. Uh, again, the, the MBTA Communities Law is going to add a little more housing than we already allow, but we need to get the storage infrastructure in there. And as, she, as Sarah was talking about, the limit on what towns can send to a regional facility, we also have a limit on what we can process and discharge from our plant. So that, you can't go over that. If you do, you get fined, you get in trouble. So 
uh, we need to make sure we have the capacity to do that, which is repairing the old pipes, as we were talking about, um, to create that capacity to put new in. So we, we don't want to just comply on paper. Mm. We want to comply and help create the housing. And the state's going to help us, and the Fed's going to have to help us. Um, you know, the federal government's going to have to step up, too, and our, our partners in the federal government are going to have to make some of that available. How has the housing crisis impacted residents in your district? It, you know, the price of housing just keeps going up. Uh, stuff that was affordable years ago, you look at it and say, how does, someone, how does someone afford that? How do we keep our police, our fires, our teachers, how do we keep them in town? Uh, because the housing stock is getting so expensive. And part of that is we have to do all this infrastructure and the cost of the taxes are going up. Um, so it's getting more and more expensive to, to build these projects to stay in town. Um, and we're losing that working class that lives, works, and does all their business in town because they can't afford it anymore. And Sarge, really quickly, this reporting is incredibly illuminating. Have you heard anything since this came out from anyone at the state level about any way that they're hoping to kind of grapple with this moving forward? Well, I've gotten more feedback on this story than any story I've ever written. Um, and a good chunk of it is people in communities being like, I've thought of this, it's a problem, here's another community that's having an issue that wasn't in the documents you found. And I haven't heard from the state, but I have heard from nonprofits, um, just seeing social media posts from them, suggesting that, you know, the story misconstrues the issue. And I gotta combat that pretty significantly because our lead does say what the MBTA Communities Act is. But the real focus here is on what happens after. And we do have to be, as Senator Edwards did say, like collaborative and try to come up with creative solutions, but there also needs to be funding for that. And I talked with this fantastic uh, civil engineer, Joe Penzola, who does a lot of trainings occasionally with towns about sewer issues. And he talked about, you know, how much sewers, um, how much water capacity needs to go into like apartment buildings that have 30 or 40 units versus 100. And he did mention that after you hit a certain cap, like you do need to like consider a sewer system. And it's mostly gonna be on developers to do that. So you really have to think in the end, like the whole point of this is to make more housing Mm -hmm. and housing affordable for people because the housing costs are astronomical right now. So if you have a developer coming in and saying, hey, I'm going to put a private wastewater treatment plant um, for this housing complex that I'm putting in here, eventually that's going to cost a lot more money. You might have the difference between 400 to 500,000 a unit to like 800 to 9,000 a unit, and that's not affordable for anyone. Someone's going to have to recoup the costs. Right. Great. Thank you so much for your reporting, Sarah Betancourt, Jim Boudreau. Thank you so much, both of you, for joining us. Thank you, Tori. Thank you. Everyone has a story to tell. And in a new documentary, we get to hear some great ones right out of Danahy Park in Cambridge. Local filmmaker Frederica Muchnik documents the stories of people from all walks of life in open space, which will premiere at the Cambridge Public Library next month. Frederico joins me now to discuss. Thank you so much for being here. So... This project was over the course of six months. I think you visited the park maybe 60 something times. Um, you know, how did you kind of fall into doing this? Well, uh, you know, documentary filmmaking is um, something that sort of involves research and exploration and discovery. So for me, um, I had just come out of uh, a project in California and um, was looking, for, you know, looking around for what to do next. And uh, Denny Park was right up the street from where I lived. And I thought, you know, I've been researching what it means to be a member of the community. Uh, what is civic engagement about? Um, who are the people in my neighborhood? Uh, what do they do? And and I started going to the park and seeing the the sheer astonishingly high degree of multiculturalism and uh, the uh, the variety of uses that the park uh, was being used for. And I thought, you know, uh, this is free lighting. It's, mm -hmm. the audio is great. You can't ask for better audio. You've got nature. Why don't I just, you know, start approaching people and ask them to tell their stories? And so it started out on May 25th of uh, 2023 and my first client or customer or victim, if you will, was, a, um, was Carl Younger, who happens to be the first person in the film. And he is a uh, African-American gentleman who is retired and who used to work at the Globe. 
but he was, you know, riffing on martial arts there in the park. And I remember asking him if I could just film him at work, you know, at, at, at play. And um, he said, sure. And we got to talking. And, you know, after shooting a bunch of B-roll, I, I did an interview of him. And then I, you know, brought it together in the editing room and I was on my way. Yeah, and you have just these series of vignettes that are, it's really a love letter to open green spaces. And I think it really profiles mm -hmm. All of the, th like the limits are only, you know, your imagination, really, right? You've got people playing frisbee and people having festivals and family gatherings and people having sport sporting events. And you talk to people, you know, immigrants who came to this country and sort of talk about their experience as well. Um, I wanted to play this clip of one woman who you spoke to who asked, you asked her what her favorite part of, about the park is. Who's in it? The fact that it has okay. such um, enormous neighborhood use and the neighborhood is situated between uh, such an interesting and broad demographic range and everybody within that range is in here using it. And that's the thing, that's what you captured. I want to take this film and put it in a time capsule because it it profiles a place and the sense of community that you were looking for, but it also shows a time, right? And the park wasn't always this lush green place. It was a landfill for a very long time um, that closed in the 70s. And you, you spoke to um, a retired Cambridge firefighter, Bill Bumper Sullivan, who talked about hanging out and playing in the park at the, the landfill when he was a kid. I was probably, I don't know, seven or eight. There would be older kids, probably 12 or 13, who would throw a cherry bomb down the rat hole, and then it would explode, and then the rat would come out another hole about 10 feet away, as if that wasn't bad enough. The kids would then shoot it with a BB gun as it exited the other hole. He's just exploding rats, right? He's talking about a completely different, I love that you included him because he's part of this history. Who else did you talk to and what did you find in, in your exploration of the park? Well, Tori, there's such a multitude of faces and people and personalities. You know, I was really taken by a lot of the kids, um, a lot of the preteens. You've got uh, these uh, very fluent English-speaking Ethiopian uh, Somali kids who are fully assimilated and who just, you know, love to play soccer. And they are, they are clearly learning about teamwork and leadership and cooperation and it's just such a you know the park just kept giving it just kept giving mm. um so that was a real that was a real real special moment i think um you know there were many many different faces and you know the film kind of presents them all in a way that mixes up in a hopefully engaging and telling way the, 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 the individual who is on, on his or her own, either reading a book or, or doing Tai Chi or whatever it is, versus the, the, the larger event, like the, the Cambridge Youth Soccer League, where you have you know, 3,000 people vying it out. And so putting the film together was an exercise in rhythm and pacing and finding the, the, the moment where you know, I sense that the audience wants to take a breather and so we go with something quieter before we come back. And that's how I think we were able to engage people and why there's been so much interest in the film. The characters are just amazing. This yeah. one kid, his face, his expressions, he's out uh, with his father, they're racing cars, oh, yeah. and here they are just talking about why the park is so important to them. Yeah, he's, he's something else. I want to play this clip. We have a clip of them, actually. Go I'd love for to it. play. Yeah. yeah. Danny, he's an amazing place. You know, he just did the soccer league, so he did soccer here. I do my walks here with the dog. I walk the track. I want to say for most of our outdoor, outdoor activities, we're at Danny, he probably 95% of that time. And you started this also during COVID, right? And you were going through some personal stuff. I don't know if you're comfortable talking about it. Just, I wonder, because you had mentioned that you were looking to highlight and profile community and yeah. where that came from personally for you. Yeah, you know, as an artist, uh, filmmaker, my, my, my personality invariably becomes enmeshed in whatever it is I'm doing. And uh, so, yeah, I had been diagnosed with, with tinnitus, which uh, has since subsided. But, oh, it, you know, it, at the time, for the people who have it, I just really empathize with them because you think it's going to be forever. Uh, that beep. 
you know, and, and over time it sort of subsided and I finally, as I mentioned to a reporter at uh, Cambridge Day, was able to sort of work through it and, 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 and just focus again on my work. But right. it was a crippling condition for about a year. And everyone was locked inside. I think that sense of community was missing for a lot of people. Yeah, and I think even though I started the film after uh, COVID, um, I really, and I think as everybody has wanted to, just felt this need to just connect with the community, my neighbors, find out who they were. You know, if I have one piece of advice to the world, it's get to know your neighbors. They're going to come in really handy when you get locked out of your apartment, you know. <laughs> Great. Awesome. Well, you have a bunch of screenings coming up. We're really excited for you. Yeah. Frederico Muchnik, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having time. me. Thank you very, very much. To get your free ticket for the film for its April 6th showing at the Cambridge Public Library, go to openspacefilmproject.net. And finally tonight, the basketball team is the Celtics. But when we're talking about classical Irish music, it's Celtic. Why? Ed Gerby Herbick III finds out in the latest edition of the Curiosity Desk. Celtic. 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 Celtic? Celtic? Celtic, 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 For years, English speakers pronounced this word with a soft C in all contexts. It's how people in the UK said it in the late 19th century when the famed Glasgow soccer team, Celtic, was formed. And it's how people around here said it in 1947 when our local basketball team debuted. Now this makes all the sense in the world. In English, when the letter C is followed by an E, it's essentially always said like an S. Think, cement, cell phone, race, and dance. Now, as for why that is, we have to go back, way back, to the time of gladiators, chariot races, etc. Or, should I say, et cetera. Latin didn't have a K. The C was the Latin reflex of the Greek kappa, and so, in classical Latin, that letter C was always pronounced K. Latin, of course, would form the basis for numerous other languages, including Italian, French, and Spanish, known today as the Romance languages. And as Latin evolved, so too did the way the letter C was pronounced. What happened was that K just doesn't stay K all the time. How come? Consonants are determined by voice, place, and manner, and a K is a voiceless back stop. When followed by a U, like in the word cut, that voiceless back stop of the K remains pretty easy to pull off. But it gets a little harder to do when it's followed by an I, like Killington, or an E, like Kendall Square. Now, over time, that began to impact that hard C. It's just a phonological process that takes place fairly organically over a course of centuries. It's a place assimilation, and that place assimilation leads to lenition, which is to say weakening, a softening. It just makes it a little less hard. This is exactly what happened as Italian developed. When the C is followed by an E, the K became a CH. The word celebrate in Italian? Celebrare. And perhaps you've enjoyed a nice after-dinner limoncello in the North End. Now, in French, the C sound went even a step further when followed by an E, all the way to SA. This is even easier on the mouth. Think C'est la vie, or the painter, Paul Cezanne. Nice and soft is how one William the Conqueror would have preferred his CEs when he and his Norman army invaded England in the 11th century. The Norman Conquest, 1066 and all that, brought French big style over to England. Not only did William take over England, but for a while he made French the official language of the land. This would permanently alter the still developing English language in numerous ways including the adoption of a soft C before the letter E. Anglo-Norman was basically the version of French that became current in England to the extent that a lot of the nobility of England were speaking a variety of French. But that French influence did not extend to the various other languages spoken around the British Isles in places like Scotland, Ireland, and Wales. 
languages of the Celts. Irish got its alphabet from Latin. It didn't get its alphabet by way of French from Latin. It just got its alphabet from monks writing using the Latin alphabet. The letter K is not a letter in the Irish alphabet. The C, not just in Latin, but also in the Celtic languages, is pronounced K everywhere. So, the rules of modern English suggest that this word should be said with a soft C. And for a long time, that's how English speakers said it. But that has changed since the mid-20th century. In recent decades, there have been ongoing efforts by many English speakers to try and pronounce words and names from other languages the way that they would have us pronounce them. Guess what? Now we're feeling bad about all that empire and we're raising our consciousness and we're like, oh yes, no, no, we have to, we have to keep the other pronunciations of all the words we've stolen. But the sports world is notorious for holding fast to tradition. Celtic. 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 And so, while we've adjusted our pronunciation of the word Celtic when talking about music or language or culture, it should be no surprise that the two places the legacy of Celtic with a soft C live on is with a soccer team in Scotland and a basketball team right here in Boston. That's it for tonight, but come back tomorrow for Talking Politics. Adam Riley will sit down with Congresswoman Ayanna Presley on the dire situation in Haiti and the local Haitian community's calls for action. Plus, President Biden is trying to win back New Hampshire after ditching their primary. And Adam's panel will tackle the state of transparency on Beacon Hill. Those stories tomorrow at 7. Thanks for watching. Good night. <laughs>